welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today in the show, we have been to Diara. She is a pre medical student and she wrote the Kevin MD article COVID 19 and the Tuskegee Syphilis Study. Been to, welcome to the show. Thank you. So we'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and journey to where you are today? I'm Bentu. I'm a junior at Brown. I'm from the Bronx, New York, so Providence is a long way from there. I'm concentrating in medical anthropology, which I like to think of as like public health's more theoretical system. That's kind of how I make sense of medical anthropology. So I'm constantly just thinking about bioethical issues. I actually came into Brown funny enough, thinking that I was going to concentrate in English and health and human biology, because I thought that those two things, I would somehow like find my niche. And I realized that like, I love reading, love writing, love literature, love science. I don't like writing about literature. I feel very limited in writing about literature. So when I took two classes on the medical anthropology class freshman year, I was like, this is my niche. Like, I like writing about contemporary issues. I like considering the nuances that we can add to discussions about contemporary issues. And that's kind of what um, I liked about writing the article that I submitted. And as a pre-medical student, tell me some of the challenges you face as you progress on your medical school journey. So content, definitely, but you know, that's a challenge for everyone. I think trying to weave in personal values is especially hard. I think there's a lot of like institutional inertia in academia. So things are very slow to change, but they are changing. So I'm kind of optimistic, but I think that's hard. Finding spaces where, again, you can add like nuance to conversations without it being like shoved into this box, not to like go too much into the article, because I know we'll talk about that eventually, but I think we have an image of what something is. So like what's seen as like a public health threat or an anti-vaxxer is like the people that like march to the White House and it's like not everyone that's vaccine hesitant is that. So I think finding the space to kind of um, weave in your personal interests and add nuance to discussions without it kind of being written off as like going against our shared goals has definitely been difficult. But I like that it's difficult because it forces me to like approach conversations with care, mm -hmm. approach other people's perspectives with care. So, yeah. All right. So let's talk more about the article that you wrote on Kevin MD. It's titled COVID-19 and a Tuskegee Syphilis Study. Now, for those who didn't get a chance to read your article, can you just walk my audience through it and share the story of why you decided to write it? It actually started out as an assignment for a class at Brown. We had to write like an op-ed about on any like unit that we kind of covered. And I was just fascinated by the unit on the Tuskegee syphilis studies. So I learned about it in high school, but upon revisiting it, I realized that there were so many missing pieces and that you could easily dismiss as like the little things, but they completely change your kind of perspective on the issue. So even like just knowing of like the longevity, right? I didn't realize that the Tuskegee syphilis study was like longitudinal in nature. I thought it was just like this one time instance and that was it. And I also didn't know of the views that inform the way people approach the, the study. So when I learned about it the second time, I was like, wow, this is just illuminating. And it speaks to so many issues that we talk about in bioethics. So I was like, let me write about this. And I think I'm like, this is constantly mentioned when it comes to this contemporary issue of COVID, right? Like when we interrogate Black Americans' decisions to not get vaccinated, the Tuskegee said, if this study is commonly mentioned. And I'm a firm believer that any counter argument is only going to be as nuanced as like the original argument <laughs> to which it responds. So I'm like the constant, oh, like black Americans aren't getting vaccinated because of Tuskegee. And then the response becomes, well, Tuskegee was about withholding treatment. So in order, like, you know, when you get vaccinated, you're exercising your agency to get treatment. And I'm like, you know, that's a great counter argument to the original argument, but because the original argument just 
in my opinion, lacks so much nuance. You can't really talk about it beyond that. So the goal in writing that was just to add the nuance that was pretty much made clear to me during that unit. Um, submitted the assignment. My professor, Lundy Braun, she really, really, really loved it. She was like, you need to edit this and submit it. I think Kevin MD would be the perfect platform. So I did some reading on your platform and I was like, I like this. I like that it's willing to kind of grapple with so many things that we kind of talk about in passing. So I submitted it and here we are. <laughs> so for those listeners who don't have a deeper understanding or knowledge of the Tuskegee syphilis study. Can you just briefly describe it? And then I also want you to talk about some of these nuances that you discovered as you were researching this paper. So the Tuskegee syphilis study was a study in Tuskegee that aimed to pretty much understand the course, the natural course of untreated syphilis in human beings. So they conducted the study well, initially they informed people that they just had bad blood, which is pretty much a term that could have meant anything to the population that they were studying because it just, it covered such a wide range of illnesses. And they pretty much chose to participate under like the impression that they would receive treatment when it became available. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, in order to meet the goal of observing the um, untreated the course of like untreated syphilis, the researchers chose to withhold treatment even as it became widely available. Mm -hmm. um, so that speaks to like one of the most unethical parts of the study. And the nuances that were illuminated during that unit was that one, they withheld the treatment and two, it wasn't viewed as this grave human rights violation mm -hmm. around the time that it was occurring. And I think that's the biggest thing, right? That like we constantly cite the Tuskegee syphilis study today and we think, oh, well, this is wrong. Like obviously wrong, you know, like j that's just unequivocally true. But during the time that it was happening, we weren't aware that it was this grave human rights violation. And that's the reason why it went on for 50 years. So when we think about the nuances, it's really important to interrogate that why did this go on for five decades right like why did this go on in such a public sphere it wasn't anything that researchers were trying to be secretive about you know it wasn't mm -hmm. something that they they thought oh like let me just hide it from like the public view no it was actually widely accepted and embraced by the public so that begs a lot of questions about what was illuminated to me in the research looking up how much even like ideas surrounding the study and the reason to take it out were rooted in like the idea of like social Darwinism, the idea that like certain populations are not likely to treat out treatment anyways, the natural confirmation bias that sometimes informs biomedical kind of research that like you do research not to necessarily seek out answers, but to kind of, you go in with your answer in mind and then you find evidence that supports the answer so it just revealed a lot of like deeply ingrained issues that kind of inform the historical legacies that we see today so i've read a lot of articles about how black americans are a little bit apprehensive about the covid vaccines and the tuskegee syphilis studies often cited as you said before as as a potential reason why so I was wondering, given your reflection on the nuances of the Tuskegee study, can you comment on that that connection that's often cited in the media about the apprehension about the COVID vaccines and the Tuskegee study? I just think it's an issue of great nuance. And mm -hmm. I think in order to increase vaccination rates in general, we have to first take steps to what like Dr. Gawande, who I love to read, he talks about embracing curiosity and what this curiosity and empathy actually mean. And I think in order to empathize with these historically disenfranchised groups, we have to choose to embrace what we don't know, right? Mm -hmm. And we, we have to embrace what has been hidden. You know, we have to really grapple with what's supposed to be and oftentimes is a very helpful field we have to grapple with, you know, the harmful histories. I think the linkage of the Tuskegee syphilis study and um, Black Americans' decisions to get vaccinated or not 
is super important and it just calls for conversation about what informs attitudes about vaccination. I think our first step there though is not conflating every single person that has a question about vaccination with like an anti-vaxxer when there are actually a lot of vaccine hesitant people around us and i'd argue that those people can kind of be swayed in the right direction but in order to sway people in the right direction we have to rely on acknowledging again these like historical legacies that have shaped the medical establishment in order to first affirm that communal mistrust and then we can move forward in pushing people to do what we see as the right thing. We're talking to Bintu Diara. She is a pre-medical student and she wrote to Kevin in the article, COVID-19 and the Tuskegee Syphilis Study. Bintu, as we reflect on this study, what are some misconceptions that you want to clear up about the Tuskegee Syphilis Study? Well, the first and main misconception surrounds the longevity of the study the idea that it was just one like medical experiment that took the course of like a few days or a few months is the first one i'd like to clear up and i think the main one actually because in understanding that the study took decades it allows you to kind of dig deeper right like why is it taking decades mm -hmm. and another misconception i personally would like to clear up is the idea that it was accepted as this like grave human rights violation around the time that it was taken out that, like we might understand it as this grave human rights violation now that we're kind of looking back because i think it's easy to like you know, our engagement with things like that retrospectively, but at the time that it was happening, it wasn't acknowledged as a human rights violation or as something that was wrong. It was just simply something that was being done for the greater good. I think those are the two main ones that I would like to come. And my final question, what are some of your take home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? Just every single thing that the medical establishment has like contributed to whether intentional or like inadvertently requires constant evaluation and analysis mm -hmm. yeah i think that's the main thing Bintu, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight and thanks again for being on the show